morning. Happy Sabbath. Let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer before we open God's word today. Dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the Sabbath. We're thankful for your word. And now, Lord, as we come to worship you today, wherever we are, Lord, we invite you into our hearts, into our lives. Lord, send the Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us into truth, to show us the way, because we know you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, bless the words that are spoken today, and may, through the power of the Holy Spirit, reach us to our inner beings, that we may be changed, that we may become more and more like Jesus. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to talk about a barrier to relationship. A love relationship with Jesus Christ is what we need. What could be holding us back? I want to speak this morning about buried resentment, subconscious anger, hidden bitterness, these things that are holding us from that love relationship with Christ. I want to talk mostly about forgiveness. We're going to talk today about our forgiving each other. And not just because when we forgive each other, that helps with our interpersonal relationships, but it also affects our relationship with Christ. Now, forgiveness is not natural. And if you have never had or have not today any problem whatsoever with forgiveness, you're a very abnormal and, I must say, a very unnatural person. Human nature is to look for revenge and to build up resentment, to feel a little discontentment when we have been wronged until we have somehow gotten even. I saw it one day, four boys playing ping pong. Just young boys, two at each end of the table. And one of the partners at this end, just good-naturedly, all in fun, reached over with his paddle and smacked his partner a little bit on the rear end. Now, he wasn't meaning, I don't believe, to be unkind, it was just a playful tap. But you know, a ping pong paddle can sting a bit, and the second boy thought it had been a little too hard to be just in fun. And so he reached across and hit that other boy just a little bit harder to make his point. And so the other boy didn't like that too much, thinking that he was only doing it in fun at the beginning. And so he came back a little harder still, and the next thing you know, they were both going at it with their paddles. And neither one of them stopped until there were four red eyes, and I have a sneaking suspicion, two red bottoms. We learn a great deal about human nature from children, because they are like us, except they have not yet learned how to hide. These resentments do not go away as we grow up. They go underground. It reminds me of three other boys who were playing together. One was a big boy, the other two much smaller. The big boy and one of the little boys were wrestling and playing, just having a good time as boys will do. But the tusk in the tussling, the big boy rammed into the other little boy who was just watching. And he felt that his pride as well as his body had been injured. And so he doubled up his fist and he hit that big boy. And he got the other fist in and he was just going at it tooth and nail. But you know how it is when a little boy and a much bigger boy fight? 
the big boy ended up just grabbing a hold of the other boy's arms, and he just stood there grinning at him. And that didn't help the youngster out one bit, because there was simply no way he could get even. And he started to cry. And as soon as he was released, he ran away. But as he went, he kept muttering under his breath all of the nasty insults he could think about that awful boy. Now notice the three things that he did. First of all, he hit that boy. Secondly, he ran away crying. And finally, he was muttering all the while. Adults don't do that. Or do they? First of all, he hit. Most of us have come to the place where we're not violent people, even when we're angry, at least not in public. But once in a while, even among Christians, there's a man who will take it out on his wife or a parent who will take it out on a child, or someone might take it out on the dog or the cat, or maybe they'll just get angry and punch a hole in the wall. Because of these angers, usually built up because of resentment against someone against whom they have no recourse, and so they take it out on weaker people, on the little people, or on the pets. The second thing that boy did, <clears throat> he cried and ran away. Anybody here who has at one time left or been tempted to leave the church because somebody in the church hurt you? It's a sad fact, but you might be surprised about how many people might be willing to come back and attend church again if they could attend at a service different from where he goes or a service different from where she attends. And then the third thing that boy did was to mutter and blame. And you know how the adults do that? We call it criticism. You see, we probably all of us have some skeletons, but we have buried them. And more than that, we have planted flowers on the grave. So that although we have resentments within our hearts, we feel we keep them hidden. And nobody can know that they're there. And if we can get the flowers to go across the top of the grave so that the skeleton really looks beautiful, nobody will ever know. What do I mean by Flowers, putting flowers on the grave. It's like when someone says, you understand I wouldn't want to be critical, but that indicates someone who is harboring resentment but wants to make it sound pretty and deny the reality of the putrefaction beneath. And you know one of the most insidious ones that you'll hear, oh, I love brother so-and-so, but. That's what I call putting a bouquet of blooming flowers on the grave. I hope I do not aggravate you when I say that probably all of us here hold some resentment. I've seen it from time to time as an elder of this church. But probably nobody is as aware of resentments within the church as the pastor people all the time complaining about what this brother, what this sister has done to wrong them. Unfortunately, many pastors spend a great deal of their pastoral ministry trying to mend fences and listen to complaints about an individual within the church. Now, our subject this morning is not going to mean very much to you unless you can dig down deeply and realize that there are some points of bitterness and some anger from a way back somewhere that are holding back your Christian experience. It may not be a thing that's ongoing. It may be clear way back to your childhood even. But only a Pharisee would say, I have no resentment. 
your family and your friends know what they are. Because the truth of the matter is that not very many of us can carry on a protracted conversation without at least a little bit of the bitterness and the anger coming out. Enough so that the folk who know you best know where the skeletons lie. Now the terribly serious thing about harbored resentment is that it's fatal to Christian growth. And yet it is so prevalent in society that we tend to dismiss it. You know, everybody has a problem. And a sin that everybody has surely can't be too sinful. Brethren and sisters, we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians are so very careful about so many things. But caffeine and alcohol and nicotine can't hold a candle to what resentment does to the soul. Remember when Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. And he talked about how they were so very, very careful when they paid their tithe of mint and anise and cumin. These things that had very small leaves and even smaller seeds, how meticulous they were to make sure they divided them up very carefully so that a tenth of all of it went to the Lord. Jesus said, this ought ye to have done, but not to have left the other undone, Matthew 23, 23. He said they needed to pay more attention to the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith, forgiveness. This ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone. Because the part of your heart that is filled with anger and bitterness, Christ is unable to fill with his love. And you're stuck and not growing as you ought. Our theme this morning, only the forgiving are forgiven. Only the forgiving are forgiven. And I'd like us to address ourselves to three questions. First of all, why must we forgive? Brethren and sisters, we must forgive because only the forgiving can accept forgiveness. I invite you to open your Bibles to... The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6. When he was giving us the great example to prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 and verse 12. Matthew 6 and verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now that little word as means in the same way. Whenever you ask forgiveness, Jesus says you should pray, Father, forgive me in the same way that I forgive those who have wronged me. Do we really want God to answer that prayer? Many people who think their sins are forgiven because they have asked for forgiveness and because they are truly sorry they committed those sins are mistaken. Verses 14 and 15. Jesus thought it was important enough to reiterate it after he gave the example of the Lord's Prayer. Just a couple of verses down in 14 and 50. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What is this, some kind of threat? Okay, you better be nice to each other or I'm not going to be nice to you. No, this is not a threat. This is a principle. This is a law of life. Don't you see, you cannot really believe in God's forgiveness if you are not able or willing to be forgiving yourself. The man who continually holds a grudge cannot accept the fact that God does not. 
Only the man who is able to forgive is able to accept the reality of forgiveness. Why must we forgive? Because only the forgiving man knows how much forgiveness costs. The unforgiving man doesn't know anything about forgiveness. The unforgiving man can never appreciate Calvary. The unforgiving man can do his token prayer by the side of his bed before he crawls in at night and go out and thoughtlessly commit the same sin the next day. But the forgiving man, the forgiving man is the man who has felt the sweat on his brow, the knot in his stomach and has had to muster up every ounce of courage until he goes to his brother or his sister and says, I'm so sorry for the wrong relationship between us. Please forgive me. That man knows the yearning for forgiveness. That man knows the liberation that forgiveness brings. That man knows the wonder of forgiveness. That man knows the healing power of forgiveness. And so that man freely extends that forgiveness to others. That man knows something about Calvary. That man, Jesus, dares to forgive because that kind of man will never presume upon the forgiving blood of Jesus. That man knows that forgiveness costs. And so God dares to forgive that man. Only the forgiving are forgiven, Jesus says. Why must we forgive? Because forgiving is Christ-like. And the Christian's goal is to be like Christ. I invite you to turn with me now to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 22. The Gospel of Luke, the 22nd chapter. A quick little story beginning with the 47th verse. We'll read through verse 51. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane, beginning with verse 47. And while he, Jesus, yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. John tells us that it was Peter who drew the sword. John 18, verse 10. Peter's first instinct when abused was to strike out and hurt back. Jesus' first instinct when abused was to heal. Are you Christ-like? What is your first instinct when a car is stalled in front of you while the light is green? Honk your impatience or to maybe wonder if there's somebody there that needs help. What is your first instinct when someone puts an elbow in your ribs or steps on your foot? What is your first instinct when someone who is supposed to be your friend walks right by with his nose straight up in the air like he was about to take off? What is your first instinct when you hear of another person's failure to pass it on or to pass it over? You can be found in this story of Gethsemane. Is your first instinct when abused to hurt or is it to heal? Why do we forgive? 
because that's what Christ was like and we mean to be Christ-like. The second question gets a little more complicated. Whom should we forgive? I believe that we should forgive the man who's wrong when we're right. Now be careful, fellow Christians. We're getting close to home here. There is nothing more insidious, there is nothing more successful in the devil's arsenal than to make sin sound like virtue. The devil says, no, don't forgive him. He was wrong. And if you forgave him, you would be approving of wrong. And you must always stand for the right. Brethren and sisters, a wrong relationship is never right, no matter what caused it, no matter who caused it. Turn with me now to the book of Colossians, the writings of Paul. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. In this chapter 3, Paul is talking about putting on the new man, of having Christ live out his life within us. And then verse 13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I'd like us to focus on the last part of that verse. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now tell me, fellow sinners, does Christ offer to forgive you because of anything that you have done to deserve forgiveness? Of course not. He forgives us because we need it, not because we deserve it. Actually, undeserved forgiveness is the most Christ-like kind. Christ forgives us not because of what we do, but because of what he has done. If we are going to be Christians, we forgive people not because they have done something now to deserve our forgiveness. We forgive people because people need to be forgiven. Because no matter what causes it, a broken relationship is always hurtful. The worst sin is not who did what to whom, but the broken relationship. Put the mending of relationship always above the placing of blame. John 3, 17, for God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Whom should we forgive? I believe that you should forgive the man who refuses to forgive you. How many problems have been in churches perpetuated by people who say, well, when he comes to me, we can get things resolved. I'm here. He knows my address. I'm listed in the church phone directory. He can call me. He can text me. He can drop me an email. I will forgive if he will come and ask for forgiveness. That's conditional forgiveness. Turn now in, the Bible, in your Bibles over to the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24. Notice what the wise man says here in Proverbs 24 and verse 29. Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. It is natural, isn't it? If he will be good to me, I will be good to him. If he will forgive me, I will gladly forgive him. That's a natural thought process. It just isn't Christian. Whom should we forgive? Mark the 11th chapter, back to the New Testament, Mark chapter 11. Verse 
Mark 11, verses 25 and 26. And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. I want to notice, I want us to notice that second phrase, if ye have aught against any. Whom should we forgive? If we have aught against any, anything against anyone. Is there a church member who's wronged you? Who's shunned you? Who spread unkind words about you? Do you carry some deep-seated resentment today that goes way back to the way your parents raised you as a child or maybe in your family, your brothers and sisters? Are there some old serious grievances or maybe some very little ones? Is there any anger and resentment that's been building up within your home, within your home, between yourself and your marriage partner? Somebody has written, the truest joys they seldom prove, who free from quarrels live, tis the most tender part of love, each other to forgive. If you have not learned how to forgive your marriage partner, you're missing the tenderest part. You know, we have so many kinds of relationships in this world. We have relationships within the church. We have relationships at work, relationships with your neighbors. And those other kinds of relationships can be temporary. If somebody offends me at work, I may choose to find somebody else to hang out with at work. You know, we have options. But when you have a situation, a relationship with the permanence that marriage brings, it kind of forces us to go a little deeper, doesn't it? We can't just say, okay, I'm just going to choose somebody else. No, if we're committed to that person, we're going to find a way to work things out. We're going to find a way to forgive each other, to repair that relationship and to move on. And now the third question, how can we forgive? If it's really true that only the forgiving are forgiven, then this is really important, isn't it? And if it's true that we all have some degree of resentment and bitterness buried deep within our hearts, how can we rise above this condition? How can we forgive? May I first of all say that if you claim to have forgiven but have not forgotten, then you're not really forgiving at all. This thing of forgiveness is very insidious to the Christian because there's no Christian that likes to admit that he does not forgive. And he means to forgive, and yet somehow he buries some of those resentments deep down within him, and they keep coming back when the situation presents itself. You ask him about it, and he says, oh, 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 I've forgiven that. But he hasn't forgotten it. Somebody has said that nobody ever forgets where they bury the hatchet. Just like the argument between the husband and the wife, and she brought up an old, old sore between them, and he said, oh, come on now, honey, I thought we decided to forgive and forget. And she said, we did. I just don't want you to forget that I've forgiven and forgotten. You've heard that phrase, forgive and forget. You know, in our human condition, it's impossible really to forget completely the injustice and the pain of what someone has done to you. Make no mistake, forgiving someone doesn't mean that you condone them or their actions. It doesn't mean that you excused what they did. It doesn't mean that you have no recollection of being wronged. It doesn't even mean that you have reconciled with them. Forgiveness is the act of letting go of your right to hurt back someone who has hurt you. 
Forgiveness means giving up the right to get even. Giving up the right to get even. Let's turn in our Bibles again to one of the minor prophets, Micah. Right after Jonah. Micah chapter 7. You know, we rightly concentrate so much on the words of Jesus and what he had to talk about forgiveness, you know, and how he came to reveal God's character of love and forgiveness and grace. And yet all through the Old Testament, as in this passage that we're going to read next, there's so many beautiful examples that tell us what God is like, if we'll only look for them. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Isn't that beautiful? The psalmist, a similar passage, Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. We must forgive as God forgives us. We must not keep bringing up the sins of the past the hurts of the past, and keep bringing them up. We must let them go and bury them. How can we forgive? When we stop judging and start loving. Turn with me, please, to our last text, back to Luke. Luke's Gospel, the 23rd chapter. Luke 23. The story of the crucifixion. Luke 23, verses 33 and 34. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Jesus refused to judge those who brought him to Calvary. When I look at that story, I think it would be pretty easy to judge them even today as I look at that story. I would claim that Judas betrayed Jesus out of greed. I would look at that story and I would claim that Pilate went against his conscience because he was afraid. I would claim that the religious leaders brought him there because of envy. And that the Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross because they were cruel. But not Jesus. There was no judging. There was only forgiving. And why did he forgive them? Because it would look good in his book, because this was the accepted thing to do? No, he forgave them because he was more concerned about their souls than he was concerned about his pain. And that is Christianity. However difficult, forgiveness in the end brings freedom to the one who extends it. Forgiving people are able to let God run the universe. They let God take care of the punishment of wrongdoers, as he wills, and in his own time. And they let God show mercy as he wills too. You look at two extreme examples of people who were unjustly treated. I can think of two offhand that are incredible examples. Joseph. And how he was treated so unjustly throughout 
his younger portion of his life so unjustly. And then Job, of course, the terrible trials that came to him such as we have never even come close to experiencing. And yet both of those men were able to allow God to work out his plan in their lives and accept the consequences because they trusted him, because they loved him, because they knew that he knew best. That's what Job and Joseph both came to. That is also what Jesus decided is demonstrated by the pardon he granted his accusers and executioners even while dying on the cross. Father, forgive them. Ultimately, every human being will have to stand before God and God will judge every person with wisdom and impartiality. Human systems may fail. We see it all the time in our society. God's justice does not. Trust in God's justice. In 1924, the first editor of Kiwanis Magazine, a man by the name of Roe Fulkerson, wrote of an encounter with a spindly and physically weak lad, as he put it, who was carrying another youngster and staggering towards a neighboring park. Pretty big load for such a small kid, he said as he met the boy. Why, mister, he smiled, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. That was the original true story almost 100 years ago that inspired that hit song, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Became the motto of Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska, whose goal it is to help troubled youth. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. I don't know, there are people all around us who do things that are pretty heavy. It's a pretty heavy load to forgive, to let it go. But we don't notice if we see them as our brothers, if we see them as our sisters, if we love them. Three questions. Number one, why must we forgive? Because only the forgiving are forgiven. Only those who have experienced what it means to forgive others will ever appreciate what it means for Christ to forgive us. Number two, whom should we forgive? If we have ought against any, anything against anyone. And number three, how can we forgive? When we stop judging and we start loving. When we begin looking at the whole of mankind as our brothers and sisters. When we have a love for others in our hearts, the love that only Christ can give us. If you take this business of forgiveness seriously, and I hope you will, I would like to make a specific suggestion your homework for this afternoon or evening. Go to your room, some place where you can be alone. Take out a sheet of paper and begin to write down the resentments that you have carried within your heart, maybe something that's happened to you recently, maybe something that's been around, weighing down on you for years, maybe since you were young things that you have carried, resentments that you've carried within your heart. Maybe between you and another church member, maybe with your spouse or family member, maybe at work, wherever it is. Write down the items that come to mind that you're still resentful of. But don't stop there. Fall down upon your knees. And just let the oceans of Jesus' love wash away the resentment, wash away the bitterness until your heart comes clean 
And that may be for you one of the most growing experiences of an entire lifetime. Let go and let God. I want to close with a very simple little story that I'll hope you listen to very carefully because it's really the whole sermon in a nutshell. Tom and Ethel, brother and sister, were fighting. Father noticed, and he was saddened by their quarrel. And Ethel saw that it hurt Daddy to see them fighting. And so she ran up to Daddy and she threw her arms around him. Please, Daddy, forgive me. But while she stood there hugging Daddy, Tom went behind Daddy's back. And Ethel, that little vixen, she stuck her head under Daddy's arm and stuck out her tongue at Tom. Daddy noticed. And Daddy sat down and took Ethel on his lap. And he said, Ethel, I so much want to forgive you. But don't you see? You've got to make it right with Tom first. Because if you shut Tom out, you shut me out. For you see, I love Tom just as much as I love you. Whatever soul has wronged you is precious in the sight of God. God loves them whether you do or not. And God knows that you and that other person are being held back from the kingdom because the two of you aren't getting along. And God says, fellow Christian, you go make that thing right with Tom. Because if you shut him out, you shut me out. Because I love him as much as I love you. Folks, let's remove the barriers between ourselves and our brothers and sisters that there may be nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Let's pray. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful this morning that we serve a God who is anxious to forgive us our trespasses. You're so anxious to forgive all of humanity for the sins that we commit against you and against each other. We're so thankful we serve such a merciful, gracious God. Lord, we want to have those same attributes in our lives we want Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit to come and live inside our hearts so that we can be gracious, so that we can be loving, so that we can be understanding, so that we too can be forgiving. Lord, forgive us for where we have gone wrong, where we have wronged you. Forgive us where we have wronged others and help us to have the courage to go to the person who has wronged us or the person who we have wronged. Whatever is causing a rift in that relationship, whatever the problem is, regardless of whose fault it is, regardless of how long it's been, help us to learn to go and make it right. Because Lord, we know you love them as much as you love us. Help us to have nothing between my soul and the Savior so that your blessed face may be seen. So there'll be nothing preventing the least of your favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.